Okay, and welcome to the second half of the Liaise Conference. Uh, Sasha Day will introduce this panel. Yeah, I'm Sasha Day. I'm from the History Department. I teach Chinese History at Occidental. Um, and we were in the first set of recipients to the Liaise, so we've actually finished up our grant cycle. So this is the last uh, group of students um, that went and did research in Hong Kong. So we've, our students have been uh, doing independent research in Hong Kong, um, uh, doing eight week long uh, sessions in the summer. Um, and we have, we've had about uh, a total of uh, I think 18 students that have gone to Hong Kong over, uh, over the cycle of our grant. Um, so today we have uh, three pre uh, presenters. We have Alan Chen, uh, Olivia Wilk, and Ryan Lee. And so I'll hand it over to them. And uh, off you go. Hi everyone, my name is Alan. I conducted my research in Hong Kong, specifically on Hong Kong street art. And I think, as a region, Hong Kong is really interesting based on its dualities and intersections. It's under the one country, two system policy, east and west, local versus global. And my project specifically tackles uh, the tensions of gentrification versus redevelopment, specifically to street art. And so, when I was coming into Hong Kong, I was really interested in gentrification studies as a sociology major. And one of the organizations I came up a lot when I was doing research and literature reviews was HK Walls. It's a <coughs> nonprofit street arts organization. And they were scrutinized for contributing to gentrification through their impl implementation of street murals throughout Hong Kong. And so they hold an annual street arts festival and throughout various parts of Hong Kong every single year. And they gained some criticism because of their practices. And so they had a partnership with Vans in their third annual street arts festival. And one of the cr critics started saying that they were contributing to gentrification, that their blatant advertisement with the Vans and the street, murals or, the street murals they were creating were actually contributing to harming the community. And so these tensions and conflicts brings me to my research <coughs> question. I was really interested in understanding how or what role HK Walls plays in the conversation of culture heritage and gentrification. And I was also interested on a theoretical level, as a region that's defined by intersections, how does this street art change Hong Kong's history, identity, and narrative? And so ultimately, after a semester or a summer in Hong Kong, I was able to conclude that HK Wall's approach towards street art is um, operates from a community-based framework. And so by recruiting local and international artists, which is free and in a multilingual for the Street Arts Festival, they create opportunities for artists while doing this in a deconstructed way. And so this highbrow art is made accessible to the local community. <laughs> in addition, the inclusion of international artists is actually consistent with Hong Kong's global identity. And so I draw on various methods to do my research. I looked at a lot of news articles, I scrutinized the organization uh, and things like op-eds. And then I did a comprehensive literature review of gentrification of art of Hong Kong's heritage more broadly. And I also was able to get an internship with HK Walls. And through that process, I was able to do a short ethnographic study in the organization itself. And so ethnography as a method is the process by which you immerse yourself into the environment. And by doing that, you learn their practices and their cultures. And that was allowed me to give, to gain a deeper insight into the organization. And through that um, internship, I was able to do a qualitative interview with the founders of HK Walls. And so my general findings found that HK Walls does a lot of community art events that are free and multilingual. They're made to be accessible for the local community, and it essentially brings art to the community in a way that's meant to engage with people. And so when artists are doing their murals, it brings a lot of foot traffic into the um, area. People are really interested in this art. People are really excited to see a sense of vibrancy in a community that's typically more run down. And in addition, the mix of local and international artists is consistent with global's, Hong Kong's global identity. However, it's really important to note that HK Wall's um, framework is very apolitical. They really see art in an art for art's sake. And I think that's something I, would, coming in, was really critical of. And so this was something that I was working with them and I was pressing them to like, be more political, be more activist -y in their work. And so what they eventually are going to do is that they're going to use their art in a more political sense and they're using their street art and street murals to work on aquatic activism. And so um, some of the research I was drawing on to apply to Hong Kong came from Northeast Los Angeles, as well as Chicano Park in San Diego. 
and both of these spaces in the Southern California area really uses art as a resistive model. And so I was able to apply some of those theories into this space and see how they're different, which really informed a lot of my research. Hi, my name is Ryan. Um, so my research topic was changing Hong Kong street food culture, an analysis of the Hong Kong food truck pilot scheme. So first, you all might be wondering why study street food? Why is it important to study food? Um, first of all, within the realm of food justice, street food since the early 1800s, as Hong Kong was just a small fishing village, um, has been really integral in providing low-income communities, and specifically workers and fishermen at the time, with an affordable food option. And as we've seen street food grow in Hong Kong, um, specifically by the 1960s, we saw it turn into Dai Tot Day night markets, where it really fostered this um, idea of community and uh, affordable entertainment. Um, and it's kind of transitioned throughout Hong Kong throughout the ages and has become really integral within the culture and Hong Kong identity. And this is really important now, specifically with the 1997 handover of Hong Kong back to mainland China and this idea of one country, two system policy, creating a Hong Kong identity and preserving what the Hong Kong identity is on contrast to a traditional Chinese identity. So a little bit of background. Um, Street stalls and street food was started in the early 1800s, and as it grew in popularity, um, it needed to be regulated. And so the term Dai Pai Dong stands for big licensed stalls, and these were actually the permits that were displayed on street food stalls um, in Hong Kong, and the name has just stuck ever since. Um, starting in the 1980s, street food really started to boom, and um, we needed to see more regulation from the city government. And so, we actually saw a shift in the city government's stance towards street food um, around the 1960s, 70s, and 80s, where they were actually starting to recall a lot of street vendors due to hygiene, uh, modernization, uh, congestion. And so in 1946, there was actually over 70,000 street food vendors in Hong Kong, which has declined now to 2016 to less than 6,000 street stalls. And that's mainly due to buyback programs, where the government is actually buying back the permits that street vendors have to sell food. Um, but yet, with this kind of idea of Hong Kong, preserving Hong Kong's identity, um, we see this kind of emergence of local, localism and activism within cultural spheres, um, specifically around street food. So in 2016, there was a fishball revolution, as demonstrated by the bottom, bottom image, um, which actually led, was stemmed from a unlicensed street food vendor selling fish balls during the New Year celebration and the police attempting to arrest this individual. And activists actually came to the scene and protested this event, which led to over 50 arrests and over 100 people um, injured, which really demonstrates the importance that people feel for preserving street food and Hong Kong identity. Um, so that kind of has led the city government to take action on with regards to street food. And that leads me to the food truck pilot scheme. Um, so the food truck pilot scheme was an initiative started by the Hong Kong city government in 2015. By 2017, in February, it was fully um, operational. And so how it works is that there's currently 16 approved food trucks that operate at eight different locations throughout Hong Kong. And it's kind of a two-year study to see how feasible um, food trucks are and can be as the future of street food as it changes and transitions in this globalized city that Hong Kong has really become. So that leads me to my research question of, as Hong Kong increasingly becomes a leading international city, how will street food culture change? And is the city government's 2017 food truck pilot scheme a model for a sustainable future of modern street food vending? And to answer these questions, I conducted uh, in-depth interviews with a few different stakeholders within street food, including Dai Pai Dong owners that currently still exist, food truck owners and workers, government employees involved in this initiative, customers as well as NGOs related to food trucks. And I came up with three main findings. First is that really these food trucks have a low demand and there's just really not enough customers for it to be sustainable practice. And that's due to a few reasons, including location. So those eight approved locations for food trucks are all catered to tourists, which really limit the food truck's ability to have a common everyday um, reception from workers or residents. And that's caused a huge challenge for food truck owners. Um, also costs to own a food truck and have it up to standard, it actually costs over 100,000 US dollars, which is a lot higher than, um, is capable for a lot of people. 
Um, and actually, the cost of the food is more expensive, too, than a lot of restaurants and other street food vendors as well. Um, and lastly, competition from uh, other uh, street food stalls as well as other restaurants nearby. In Hong Kong, for those who've been, there's food everywhere. So, um, My second main finding is strict regulations. Um, due to the hygiene and Hong Kong's attempt to make it a modern, clean city, um, there's strict regulations for food safety within food trucks, which has limited and increased the cost to operate for the food truck owners. As well as the location, um, they can only operate at eight locations, and they can only operate within a certain time frame. So they can't go to a different spot if they think there's higher demands. Um, if you want to go get a late night taco, you can just go to the taco truck nearby, but here you can't do that because they can only operate within specific hours. And lastly, there's barriers to entry. So street food has long been an idea of providing affordable food for low-income communities, as well as providing uneducated and lower community um, people with a job opportunity. But because you have to spend over $100,000, there's too many barriers to entry, and it's actually favoring those with existing establishments and restaurants that have the capital to have a food truck. So that brings me to my conclusions and some suggestions that I have. If we want food trucks to be this model for a sustainable future of food, uh, for street food in Hong Kong, because of the importance, we really want to try and preserve street food and preserve the Hong Kong identity. But the current model is unsustainable. So instead, we should see a restructuring of how we operate food trucks in Hong Kong from a bottom-up approach that holistically takes in the different <laughs> stakeholders from food truck owners to low-income individuals as well as current street food vendors to see how we can better implement food trucks to really serve the communities that they're meant to serve and not just tourists. And lastly, we need to loosen regulations and lower barriers to entry to ensure that um, we don't lose this idea of what street food is, and we can preserve that integrity and in the Hong Kong identity. So, thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. My name is Olivia Wilk, and I am a, a junior diplomacy and world affairs East Asian studies major, and along with my colleagues, conducted research this last summer at the Chinese University of Hong Kong. My project was entitled Trapped the Subdivided Housing Crisis. For many of you in this room who have visited Hong Kong, I'm sure you are all familiar with the incredible high rises and the lavish apartment buildings. However, the grim reality is that the vast majority of people living in Hong Kong live in completely inadequate housing. There is a phenomenon in Hong Kong known as subdivided housing, which occurs when a property owner takes an existing, for example, studio apartment and divides it into multiple individual units, allowing them to increase their income and then forcing residents to live in extremely um, small housing. The housing is often unsanitary, unsafe, and also illegal. Currently in Hong Kong, there are nearly 200,000 individuals living in this kind of housing. And many of these people are children um, and also immigrants as well. So in prefer preparing for this research, I asked the question, why is there this phenomenon of subdivided housing? We don't see this happening in any other like extremely large city, a globalized city like Hong Kong is. In my literature review and preparing for this research, I identified three main factors that have led to this crisis. The first are the land use policies in Hong Kong. The majority of space in Hong Kong are natural parks, reserves, where both commercial developers and the government um, are not allowed to build on that land. Additionally, the public housing system in Hong Kong is very complicated and there are not really that many options for people. The wait list can be up to 10 years. Um, and for those who are able to acquire public housing, they often stay in it for long periods of time, preventing new um, immigrants and people from coming in. The last factor is simply the high cost of living in Hong Kong. Hong Kong is one of the 10 most expensive cities to live in the world, and the rates of apartments are comparable with Manhattan, Los Angeles, um, London. However, the minimum wage in Hong Kong is a lot lower. Now, these factors have been present for a long period of time, which made me ask the question, what alternative options are there to deal with this housing crisis? And so this past summer, I looked 
into alternative efforts, just kind of innovative strategies among non-governmental organizations to see what new views there are, what new strategies there are to solve this issue, and also evaluating their challenge, the challenges that they faced, and then also um, their successes. <clears throat> so my methodology included interviewing five different organizations in Hong Kong that are using different strategies to combat subdivided housing. I also accompanied a Hong Kong University PhD student um, with, on her field research and was able to visit um, numerous different subdivided units across Hong Kong and speak with the residents. Lastly, I also was able to attend several housing protests in Hong Kong, um, as you can see in this picture, um, to chat as well with um, the activists about their opinions on this issue um, and their perspectives on the best way to address it. So after a summer of research, I identified two non-governmental organizations that are really bringing new innovative perspectives to deal with this issue. The first is a social um, enterprise called Lightbee. Lightbee matches, um, matches tenants who are responsible with what they call unlocked property in Hong Kong. So currently in Hong Kong, despite the high demand for housing, there are many completely empty spaces. Often wealthy people will come to Hong Kong, buy property, and leave it empty for years and years and years. So what Lightbee does is find property owners who are willing to rent out their property at a rate divor divorced from market price to people who are really in need. For example, the past couple of years, Lightbee has able to um, find many single mothers with children who have been homeless in the past, who have lived in subdivided housing, and then link them with very generous people who own these properties and are extremely willing um, to contribute to social change. The next uh, non-governmental organization I found was actually an architecture firm called Domat. What Domat does is it works with subdivided housing residents to build um, modular furniture for these places. What Domat found is that they could not go in individually to each subdivided housing unit and try to alter the interior itself. So what now they do is they go into these dif different locations and they find the best way to organize furniture that improves the lives of the residents. For Domat, both Domat and Lightbee, they recognize how difficult this issue is to tackle. And so their models are all about finding just different, like it says, unlocking, finding new innovative ways for them to combat this uh, problem. Um, I thought this, my, um, this was really interesting because I think this way of thought is um, just a really innovative approach. There were no, instead of trying to change the policies, implement rent control, they were just finding existing resources and utilizing them. Um, and then also on behalf of my <laughs> colleagues um, and Professor Day, I just would like to thank everyone for having us today. Um, and if you have any questions, feel free to ask. Okay, we have time for a couple questions. Yes. I have a question for Ryan. Um, so a very interesting project. Um, my question is, did you find in your research or in your um, interviews within the methodology that um, there was like a customer value proposition that was leaning towards food trucks over street food, um, either in, from tourists in comparison to locals or in general, was there something that differentiated um, food trucks other than the obvious like uh, presentation of the food? Um, yeah, so one of the parts of interviewing the customers was I actually got to hear the perspective of tourists as a customer versus residents as a customer. Um, and it's actually seen very differently. Um, I think the perspective for a lot of the tourists is it's seen as something familiar. Um, oftentimes when you're traveling to a new country, you can be wary of the food that you're eating. So I think for them it was a way to eat something familiar while also trying new kind of maybe specifically Hong Kong foods. Versus for residents, I think they really saw it as um, 
something very different. And at first, actually, when they were first released in February 2017, there was huge lines, all residents, really excited to try this new um, food phenomenon. But we quickly saw those numbers decline, and that's mainly due to a number of reasons, including it's hot in Hong Kong and humid. People don't want to go and eat outside when they could eat in an air-conditioned restaurant, especially when the food is comparable in price. I think a lot of times we often go to food trucks because it's cheaper or it's faster or more convenient than sitting down at a restaurant. But I think that culture is very different in Hong Kong, and that's another challenge that we we'll see with that. Thank you. Yeah. Also, a question for Ryan. You mentioned that the food trucks are only allowed to operate in, under, in certain regions instead of freely moving around. So could you comment a little bit about how those particular regions where they're allowed to operate are distributed throughout the city? Yeah, so they were actually selected um, by the committee overseeing the, pro, uh, the pilot scheme, and they were catered to eight specifically um, tourist locations. So like by the Star Ferry Pier, um, by a famous temple, uh, by Ocean Park, which is a huge amusement park. Um, but it's actually interesting because there is a review process going on by the city government, and they actually did see the locations being one of the limitations to the pilot schemes. So they actually opened up a ninth location, which is at Hong Kong's Biotech Park, and so that obviously is catered to walk workers, and I think they are trying to shift it in that direction, but according to the current pilot program, that is a big limitation. When they added the food trucks, did they restrict the stalls? Um, they didn't restrict the stalls any more than they kind of already have. Um, I think there was a big buyback program in the 80s where we saw a huge decline, but it's still continuing today. I mean, um, one of the papers I read saw, I believe it was in 2014, they removed another 6,000 um, food truck. I mean, uh, food stalls. Yeah. So it's, it's continuing to decline. I have a question for um, Adam about the artivism aspect and how it seems like your approach was kind of informed by your understanding of art as political. Um, and so talking to artists or looking at, you know, having these interviews, what, how did you reconcile that? Right, so I think some of the theories I was reading on in Southern California, specifically Northeast LA as well as Chicano Park, those populations of people really use art as a form of resistance, right? And so in Chicano Park, when they built all these freeways, the way for them to protest was using art to show that we're not going to, like, that even though we're going to tolerate these freeways, we're going to use and spread our culture and really, like, solidify their space there. And so coming into Hong Kong with that kind of mindset, I really had to broaden my own understanding of it. And so HK Walls, as an organization, is essentially very, it's apolitical in that it's the the liaison between artists and the ability to create murals. And so the actual artists have free liberty to be political in the art that they're creating. But HK Walls as an organization is really just connected with resources, with housing, with paints, and all these things. Does that help? Yeah, thank you. Um, my question is also for Alan. You had talked a little bit about how HK Walls had been like accused of gentrification by um, kind of it seems like a little bit, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but kind of like a, like an elite group within Hong Kong by academics and also by like newspapers. So can you talk a little bit more about where you kind of saw this resistance to HK Walls Organ, um, where you kind of located it um, in the rest of like Hong Kong and what kind of like, um, I guess Hong Kong or identity are those sorts of people trying to put forth and trying to like create in contrast to the one that's kind of incorporated into HK Walls? Sure, I think you make a really great point about the academic side of it. I think the idea that art and gentrification are linked at all is a very academic point of view. Mm -hmm. And so for a lot of local community members, they don't see it in that type of way. Oh. For local community members, they see it art as beautiful. They see art as a way to bring people together. Mm -hmm. They see art to make community events. And so I think one of the ways that HK Walls as an organization was caught off guard is that they're not academics. They're just artists. Yeah. They're really interested in showing art and presenting art, mm -hmm. and so that's where some of their criticism was coming from, mm -hmm. because they didn't have that academic perspective of how gentrification and art are closely connected, and that when you bring culture to a community, that can easily raise the class of the community as well. And so because they didn't have the academic background, they were not able to consider how to respond to criticism when the criticism occurred. Mm -hmm. And so when I came and I was able to offer some of that academic background, 
and they were really they were really receptive in that and because they don't want to contribute to gentrification. Mm -hmm. And so in response to some of the criticism they've got and some of the help that I've been able to give them, they really want to use some of their art to become more political in the future, specifically using it to inspire like aquatic activism or like wildlife preservation. Mm -hmm. So Olivia I thought the subdivision of those apartments was illegal, and if it is, what happens to the owners who do subdivide when they're caught? But more importantly, what happens to the people living in those apartments that are subdivided? Right, thank you. That's a great question. Um, the vast majority of subdivided units are illegal. Um, however, because there are so many people living in them, in often cases, the government kind of turns a blind eye. If overnight they were to kick everyone out of those locations, we would have hundreds of thousands of people homeless. Um, however, from time to time, the government does enforce these policies um, in a very kind of arbitrary, bureaucratic manner. When this happens, it, the landlords are not usually the ones facing any consequences. Um, it's mostly for the residents themselves. They often accumulate fines or are forced overnight to leave the subdivided housing. Um, I think it was in like 2015, 2014 or 2015, the government um, forced an entire subdivided housing residence for everyone to leave overnight. It was definitely the residents who um, really faced um, the most hardship. Um. Okay, thank you very much.